Richard Goida, a big welcome to Business Weekend. Nice to be with you, Tiki. Good on you. Now, um, extraordinary election results, obviously, with Scott Morrison coming back. Um, what went through your mind as you saw the results coming through? <laughs> well, uh, like a lot of people, I was somewhat surprised uh, when the early numbers came through. And um, as the night went on, it, it felt a bit like Brexit and the Trump election, that, you know, people had predicted something else, but all the numbers were going one way, and uh, that's the way it turned out. And... Uh, it was quite a memorable night. I was uh, I was in good company, and uh, yeah, it was it was a I think a reasonably historic night. And um, certainly, I think for the country now, it provides an opportunity to you know to really move forward to make some great progress in in building the economy and, and in building the economy, building the country as well. Was it a better outcome for business? Do you think than Labor? Well, I I, th I think business can work with either party. Um, you know, what business wants is, is the table set with um, policies that encourage investment, encourage appropriate risk taking and employment. Mm. And so, you know, I, I think uh, business will work with whoever. But, you know, I do think uh, um, Josh Frydenberg handed out a, a really good budget and, and I, I feel like the table is set and, uh, you know, we can get on with things. Well, just on that investment certainty, we've had uh, the big gas meeting at APIA this week in, in Brisbane. Uh, you're chairman of Woodside, of course. Now, before the election, you called for a national energy policy that everyone could get behind, you know, carbon rules. Now, Matt Canavan, the Resources Minister, Angus Taylor, the Energy Minister, say they've a mandate for their energy, pol energy policy. Effectively, business should get back in its box. Well, I think what business wants to do is get on with things. Uh, and the point that Peter Coleman and I have made is, you know, Woodside's looking with our partners at investing billions of dollars in the northwest of the country in the coming years with Scarborough and Browse. And we want certainty around what emissions regime where we'll be in, how we're going to look at meeting our Paris obligations. And we need certainty from state and federal governments in, in, in the way we look at that, because these are 20 and 30 year projects. These aren't sort of uh, small, small deals, they're big deals, they'll employ thousands of people. Well, does, and, the government, and, but does the government's policies as they stand deliver that certainty? Because, uh, you know, the head of Conoco who spoke this week, it didn't seem to me that it delivered that sort of certainty to them. Well, I, I think Angus Taylor said, and I think it, He's talking more to East Coast gas companies, but get on with things and we'll only intervene if, if you don't do the right thing. Mm. Um, and that's fine. Yeah, let, let the market work. But we do need to understand what the emissions regime is going to be, how we are going to meet our Paris obligations. And the, the issue Woodside's got, frankly, has been more with the West Australian Government, EPA, uh, and, and the draft guidelines it put out some months ago, which it's now pulled back from. But it's back but on the agenda. They, yeah, and, and that, that's a pretty important deal for us mm. because you know, nowhere in the world is there um, full abatement on, on the sort of projects we're looking at. And, and at Woodside, we clearly understand our obligations around reducing our own emissions. But you know, the world needs gas to, to meet its climate change um, obligations, if you like, mm. and our gas is a big part of that. And... You know, my hope is the West Australian Government and the Federal Government will, will have policies that support us making the investment and our partners making the really significant investment we're looking to make in, in the relatively near future. Uh, a lot of people calling a rate cut on Tuesday. Now, do you think a cut or even two cuts could really stimulate this economy? And if the answer to that is unlikely, then why should the RBA be lowering the buffer, the small buffer that it's actually got? Well, Tiki, I, I think we've been really well served by the Reserve Bank over many years uh, in this country. And uh, so I'm not going to second guess Philip Lowe and his team on rate cuts. Presumably there's issues around currency, there's issues around the housing market uh, and consumer confidence. And I think post the election there is an opportunity to inject some confidence into the economy and that would be a really good thing. So 
But do you we'll think lowering a rate would, would deliver confidence? Because a lot of people think uh, that's a sign of weakness that's seen in the economy. Well, uh, you know, uh, we're a trading country, so clearly our currency, uh, inflating currency, is really important and, and, mm. and the exchange rate's important. Uh, people have, you know, significant mortgages and if the banks pass through interest rate cuts, that will flow through. Do you think they we will? Get tax well, I would hope so. If we get tax cuts passed by the Parliament, you know, those things will all inject um, some liquidity, if you like, into, into uh, the economy. And, and, as I said, uh, an injection of uh, confidence would be a really good thing as well. Notwithstanding uh, the Morrison government getting back in, of course, the rise, the power, the influence of uh, union-backed industry funds is, uh, is a huge shift. Now, what about the concerns that uh, Sally McManus and the ACTU feel that industry funds should use their influential positions on public company registers to push for uh, wage rises that are not related to productivity growth? Particularly, I, I think just as directors' obligations are pretty clear, I think the obligations of trustees of superannuation funds are pretty, pretty clear as well, and their obligations are to the, the members of the fund. Interestingly, you know, when, as a CEO, when I would go and see shareholders, including superannuation funds, they wanted to talk about how the company was going and performance and outlook and investment. Yeah. Now that I'm a non-executive director, um, I spend more time talking about remuneration, climate change and other factors. Yeah. One of the things that's struck me, Tiki, is that um, these, these funds want independent directors, but when I go and see them, they actually don't want us to be independent. They want us to do their bidding for them. And uh, at the end of the day, as, as directors will be independent and we'd expect them to fulfil their roles as trustees as well. Mm. Do you think there should be more independence on these industry super boards themselves? Well, I, I think independence is a two-way street. Mm. And uh, okay. uh, I, I, I sort of... I smirk a bit when I go into some of these meetings and they... they they talk and they say, you know, are your directors independent and then this is what we want you to do. Right. Uh, and that, that sort of, there seems to be some sort of conflict there. So uh, what about, of course, they've got to grow. They're looking at the private equity market. Should directors of publicly listed companies fear having industry super funds on their register? Not at all. Not at all. You know, I, industry super funds should be long-term investors and, and should be, I think, very supportive shareholders, but also um, hold companies to account for what they're doing in the environment and, and with all stakeholders in an appropriate way. OK. Uh, you are chair of Qantas. They're going to be 100 next year. The airline's going to be 100. It's a, it must be a great honour to be chair at that time. You've uh, uh, put Alan Joyce in for another three years. What's your vision for the airline? Well, yeah, I am um, incredibly honoured to to be on the board of Qantas, let alone chair, and uh, next year will be an incredibly exciting year. And uh, you know, it's the sort of national flag carrier and an iconic brand in the country, so we'll celebrate with the country that centenary next year. And uh, it's marvellous that Alan uh, will be CEO through that period and, and beyond because I think he's done an exceptional But how can job you make sure there's not another national, international grounding, for example, ever in the, in the history of the airline? <laughs> well, we would... Uh, you know, Qantas is travelling well at the moment. It's, uh, it's in pretty good shape. We've got... Um, you know, there's always issues to manage in an airline and, and it can be reasonably volatile, but, uh, you know, we've got good relationships with all our stakeholders. It's a very well-run organisation. And, and our, where we want, to take, we want to take Qantas increasingly to the world. You know, Project Sunrise is incredibly exciting, I think, direct... Sydney, London, Sydney, New York flights, and imagine what that can do, that capacity can do to other, other routes and other sectors, and mm. in the meantime, offering you know, terrific uh, products and services to our customers domestically. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's lots to do in Qantas. We've got an outstanding CEO, and uh, I'm privileged to lead that board. Richard Goida, it's terrific to have you on our first show. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dickie, and good luck with it.